Present day Lake Toba is the Earth's largest volcanic lake. And it's also the largest quaternary caldera to have formed on our Earth. The main lake today is what remains after the largest volcanic eruption in the last 100,000 years occurred, sometime around 74,000 years ago. But this lake and the volcanism at this caldera has a history that stretches much further back in time, when a past eruption at a similar scale to the most recent occurred, alongside two other caldera forming eruptions of varying intensity. The actual chemistry of Lake Toba is beginning to be understood to such a degree that we are starting to form an understanding into why the Toba Caldera Complex is so powerful and the size of the batholithic magma chamber is becoming increasingly understood and it's now clear that nearby volcanoes are actually tapping into Lake Toba's massive magma chamber and are using it to fuel their own eruptions. In this video we are going to cover the older three volcanic eruptions to have occurred at Lake Toba prior to its most recent supervolcanic eruption, and we're also going to get a clearer idea into why Lake Toba in particular is as powerful as it is, and how it differs from other volcanic systems. The late Quaternary Toba Volcanic Tectonic Depression, try say that a hundred times, in the Sunda Arc is the largest resurgent cauldron in the world and it lies in one of the largest ignimbrite fields to exist in present day. It's worth defining ignimbrite as that will help to better understand what we are going to talk about in this video. Ignimbrite is a deposit left over after a pyroclastic flow. A pyroclastic flow is basically a ground hugging cloud of instant death in the form of a superheated suspension of particles, gases and larger semi-molten rocks that flow rapidly from a volcano which are, at times, capable of reaching speeds up to 700 km per hour or 190 meters per second. The gases and tephra can reach temperatures of about 1000 degrees Celsius or 1800 degrees Fahrenheit and can flow for hundreds of kilometers if an eruption is powerful enough. Ignimbrites form as a result of immense explosions of pyroclastic ash, lapilli and blocks flowing down the sides of volcanoes and they are arguably the most dangerous element present during a volcanic eruption, matched closely in my opinion by Lahars. Lake Toba in present day is 35 by 100 kilometers in size, but its history of explosive eruptions actually started at least 1.3 million years ago. Prior to this date it's very likely that effusive eruptions were the beginning of this volcanic system's start leading to a capping of the magma chamber which would begin a cycle of pressurization during which the chemistry of the low silica basaltic magma would begin to change, as it would intermingle with continental rocks, and it began to derive fuel from a few unique sources that we will cover later. The lake itself is elongated in a parallel direction to the active volcanic front of Sumatra in a northwest to southeast direction, and it seems that its existence is similar to New Zealand's supervolcano in that the caldera itself exists in a margin of weakness within the crust, where the land is actually stretching outwards in a rift-like manner, rather than compacting inwards like most other parts of the crust would during subduction. But at some point around 1.3 million years ago, Toba changed and went from being a silent dot on the land that existed solely as effusive lava flows to a violent element with a danger level that would only increase with each passing year. The Harangale Dacite Tuff is what was released from this eruption and it's thought that the caldera collapse was located in the northern part of the present day rim. This volcanic eruption was more of a standard Plinian eruption. It's possible that there might have been a small volcanic cone or dome or possibly even a large stratovolcano constructed at this point in time from the effusive leaking of viscous lava from the magma chamber, which was at this point in time beginning to become silica and mineral enriched due to the aforementioned chemistry change that has taken place after effusive lava flows started the volcano's life. It's worth mentioning that it's very difficult to map older calderas in a place that literally blows itself to pieces every few hundred thousand years, so accurately mapping this area is a nightmare and true scale can never be fully understood because of how disastrous the eruptions are and how much they change the land and hide the past when each subsequent one occurs. 
The Harangale Dasai Tuff ranked as 6 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index and released 35 cubic kilometres worth of ignimbrite. The pyroclastic flows were quite large and this eruption would have been destructive and very dangerous to be around. And the magma chamber of this eruption actually collapsed and formed Lake Toba's first ever caldera. This eruption would have been very similar to the 1991 Mount Pinatubo eruption, which also collapsed into a caldera and was the second largest volcanic eruption of this century. The eruption produced high speed pyroclastic flows and lahars and released a cloud of volcanic ash that stretched hundreds of miles across. But this was just the start of Toba's violent cycle. Toba went silent after the last eruption for around 400,000 years. During that time, a caldera lake had formed in the tiny little dot where the previous eruption had occurred at. It was tiny at least compared to what it would soon be, when another eruption would lead to it becoming something that would be more recognisable to us in present day. You see, this volcano was hard at work in every moment of those 400,000 years, and wasn't ever once silent in making its presence known in the form of volcanic earthquakes and by altering the land's topography. Uplift had occurred on the land as a result of the massive amounts of magma that had begun to fill the batholithic magma chamber that existed beneath Toba. And around 800,000 years ago, an eruption very similar to Lake Toba's most recent occurred. It was devastating in size. The estimations are very likely to be far smaller than the reality of what was released during this eruption, similar to how statistics are in present day when covering the youngest Toba Tuff. Which is, by the way, what the Tuff released by the most recent eruption is called. The old Toba Tuff is its obvious counterpart. It was another cataclysmic eruption that more or less mirrored its younger version. It released an estimated 800 to 2,300 cubic kilometres worth of material and formed a massive caldera that would become Lake Toba's first and original inception into life in a way that more closely resembles what we know and recognise in present day. This eruption released very large pyroclastic flows and would have without a doubt altered the planet's climate, producing a volcanic winter. The caldera lake produced would fill in within the next 2000 years of water following the eruption. But the amazing thing is that right after this eruption, along with every other eruption that's ever occurred at Lake Toba, the magma system would immediately spring into action and the mass filling of it would occur as soon as the eruption ended without a break. And the nearby volcanoes would continue to erupt even after a large scale eruption had occurred at Lake Toba. Meaning the magma chamber is so large that even after a supervolcanic eruption, it still didn't release all of that magma that it had stored up and nearby volcanoes were still tapping into it and erupting from it. After this, there would be another period of refilling, lasting in the hundreds of thousands of years. And around 500,000 years ago, the Middle Toba Tuff was released in a form of a larger Plinian explosion compared to the first eruption that had occurred at Lake Toba. Like it, this eruption also ranked a 6 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index and released around 60 cubic kilometres worth of welded and non-welded ignimbrite and associated ashfall deposits. This volcanic eruption also formed a caldera. And after it, over 400,000 years would pass before the youngest supervolcanic eruption that formed present-day Lake Toba's caldera occurred, which was by far the largest volcanic eruption to have ever occurred from this volcanic complex. So I just want to nerd out a little on the magma fueling Lake Toba and explain why its chemistry is so volatile and is strong enough to produce a supervolcano at this scale. Aside from the aforementioned tectonic stretch that's occurring here, Lake Toba is deriving melt from a few different sources. First of all, Lake Toba's magma would be basaltic in its most basic of origin, beginning at a point where the nearby subducting tectonic plate has begun to become so pressurised that the heat and pressure causes the crustal rocks in the plate to deform. In this state of deformation, rocks don't act how they do on the surface. They are not solid and in a state that can be shattered so to speak. They are hot, rubbery in consistency and ductile. And when they exist in this state, any water that was carried down by the subducting plate, which is stored within hydrous minerals located within the crust, is released. The release of this water exists in a state that, like the rock, is altered and acts differently to how water does on the surface. 
It exists in a state known as a supercritical fluid, which is any substance that exists at a temperature and pressure above its critical point, where distinct liquid and gas phases don't exist, but below a pressure required to compress it into a solid. The release of this water lowers the melting point of the mantle, which turns the rock into basaltic magma. This magma begins to rise up through weaknesses within the earth for many kilometers until it reaches a magma chamber, or the surface if it can, in the form of effusive lava flows. This is what originally happened to Lake Toba, and after some large effusive flows, it got capped, and magma got trapped. Because magma got trapped, the extremely hot basaltic magma began to pool and accumulate in chambers. Basaltic magma is very hot. It exists at a temperature that is several hundred degrees higher on average than falsic magma. Falsic magma is what the largest volcanic eruptions require to exist though, so how did the basaltic magma change? The hot basaltic magma is able to melt continental crust with ease, and this melting is what triggered the chemistry change. But this is basically what happens with all Plinian level eruptions, so what makes Toba so special? Well, it seems like it's tapping into a massive granitoid body that's located nearby to the chamber. It's assimilating a massive local granitic basement, and it's essentially remelting the remnants of a once active magma chamber that had frozen within the earth and died. It's revitalizing it by consuming it via remelt, and this remelt is drastically altering the chemistry of the magma chamber. Because this ancient extinct magma chamber was granite, it was made up of falsic chemistry. And along with this fuel source, the magma chamber itself is primarily melting ancient metavolcanics and metasediments, which are basically sedimentary deposits and older volcanic deposits formed by ancient eruptions, which have been metamorphosed by the nearby subduction and volcanic intrusion. The metavolcanics would be contributing to the massive rise in silica because it would have more than likely been from other past falsic eruptions that occurred nearby in a Plinian or subplinian level, and Lake Toba is just recycling it. Not all effusive lava remains trapped though. After the most recent supervolcanic eruption, Lake Toba erupted twice only 15 to 20,000 years after that, which is a very short time period. And when it did erupt, it released lava flows, which buried all the lava flows that were released following the supervolcanic eruption that occurred here 800,000 years ago. To me, this shows a pattern. If I was to speculate, it seems like when the magma chamber has thoroughly emptied itself out after a super eruption, the chemistry is drastically altered and becomes less silica enriched and more effusive for a short period of time during which melt takes place at an increasing level, and magma is able to rise to the surface easier only until the magma chamber begins to re-establish a stronger falsic chemistry. Perhaps the volume of basaltic magma rising from the crust is so tremendous that it's responsible for the drastic change post super eruption that occurs in the form of lava flows compared to explosive eruptions. Around 400,000 years after the most recent Toba super eruption, it released another explosive eruption that created an ash cloud that released an airfall tuff layer that exists today, showing that the chemistry had once again re-altered to the point of becoming explosive. Or maybe this is just speculation and only that. The major stratovolcano north of Toba, Cinnabung, shows strong geochemical kinship with Toba, and zircons from recent eruption products suggest Toba's climactic magma reservoir extends beneath Cinnabung and is being tapped during eruptions. So Toba will continue to be a supervolcano for the foreseeable future, until eventually the tectonics of the region change, where it will then join the graveyard of calderas that compose past supervolcanic eruptions that lived in glory and died with time. So this is the story of Lake Toba, until the next eruption occurs. Thank you for watching. If you made it this far, consider sharing this video around. It really helps the channel out. If you're a fan of volcanism, geology, geography, earth science or science in general, then consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the like button. I'll be releasing more content like this regularly. Leave a comment letting me know what you think about this video, and if you have any video suggestions, please do let me know. Thank you again, I'll see you all real soon.